This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 285, recorded on March 20th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. The TWIV wagon this week ends up in Virginia, Blacksburg, Virginia. I'm at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, better known as Virginia Tech. And I've gathered two virologists here to do a TWIV with. I really thought you guys would cheer when I said Virginia Tech. Have an audience of one, two, three, four, five, six, clearly graduate students because they have no college spirit at all. <laughs> uh, all the way on my left, uh, my first guest is a university distinguished professor and also a professor of molecular virology in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology at the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine, XJ Meng. Hello, Vincent. Welcome. Welcome to Blacksburg. Do I have all the uh, appointments correct? There's got there everything there. Okay, a lot of uh, words there, but uh, I've known you for many years. Study section, mostly, right? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, so it's great to visit and uh, talk about your work. Okay. Wonderful. Also, my other guest is a professor in that same Department of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology, as well as a professor at the School of Medicine here, which I believe is called the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. It's Sarah McDonald. That's right. Thank Welcome. You. Thanks. I got a, all that right? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the websites here. are wrong. <laughs> I did a TWIV in Brazil, and I read the guy's thing, and he said, no, 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 that's all wrong. <laughs> I'm not there anymore. <laughs> so, okay. You never know. Websites can be wrong. Anyway, we welcome both of you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Appreciate it's it. A I, really, I really enjoy uh, showcasing the virology at all the places I visit. So I'm really glad you want to do this. Now, we start on these uh, on-the-road twivs by finding out uh, where you were born and raised and educated. And we find out interesting things that there aren't so many degrees of separation between scientists. So, XJ, why don't you... Tell us where you came from. Sure. I uh, grew up in China mm -hmm. and uh, in a small town, which is now part of a major coastal city uh, called Qingdao. And actually, Qingdao was the site of the water event for the 2008 Summer Olympics. Okay. And so it's a beautiful coast city. And uh, I went to medical school in China and uh, planning to be a physician, uh, that clearly didn't happen. And uh, so after medical school, I enrolled in a graduate program in China. Uh, it's a master program in microbiology and immunology. And I studied papillomavirus and herpes virus for three years. And after that, I came here to the state and I believe it was in 1991 and then pursuing a PhD degree at Iowa State and work on the pig virus. And back then, it's an emerging virus uh, known as post-sign reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. Uh, and, you know, uh, in short, it's a PERS. Uh, it's an arterial virus and causing a devastating disease in pigs. And so after that, I went to NIH. Who did you do that work with? I did with Prim Paul. I don't know if you know him. It's a very good. Uh, veterinary virologist, and he left science a little bit earlier pursuing an uh, administrative career. He's mm -hmm. currently uh, the vice chancellor for research and economic development at the University of Nebraska. Uh, so yeah. I worked with him for four and a half years, uh, did my PhD with him. It's a wonderful experience there. I met him in Nebraska when I visited, I think, two years ago. The wonderful, yeah. He established the uh, Nebraska Center for Virology, right. and, and, uh, and they're recruiting a lot of very good virologists there. And uh, so after that, I went to NIH and did my post out there and uh, worked with Bob Purcell and Sue Emerson. And, and uh, uh, initially, I planned to work on the hepatitis C virus. For some reason, we, uh, I think the first year I was in the lab, we end up discovering the swine hepatitis E virus. 
So I decided to stick on with that virus and work on, on the hepatitis C virus. And uh, so I spent there for about four and a half years in, at NIH, and, and, and then I joined here, uh, joined the faculty here, and has, has been here ever since. Hmm. So uh, at NIH, you must have known Steve Feinstone. I do know him. I do Steve actually is the very first post of Bob Purcell. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve is now, I believe, in the FDA, so one of the lab chief there. And, and uh, yes, I do know him. How about well, John Ticehurst? Yes, I do know. Uh, John is, uh, uh, he used to be in the Hopkins, I believe, and mm -hmm. uh, epidemiologist. Okay. Yep. So I'm not just dropping names, but no. <laughs> there's a point to this. So when I was finishing my postdoc at MIT, so we had just cloned the polio genome, and John showed up one Monday. And he said, I said, what, what do you want? <laughs> well, not, I didn't say that, but I said, what can I do for you? He said, well, David said I could come and learn how to clone a hepatitis A viral genome before you leave. I think I had two weeks left to go. So I said, okay. So we, in two weeks, we cloned the genome, and he went back with that and, and worked with it quite a bit uh, in Bob's group, I think. Yeah. We ended up publishing that as well, yeah. How about you, Sarah? Where are you from? So originally I was born in Ohio, in North Canton, Ohio, but when I was very young my parents moved to Florida. So mm -hmm. I was actually raised in Clearwater, Florida, which is near Tampa Bay. Right. Um, I do a radio show out of Clearwater every Saturday, once a month on Saturday. Oh, really? I don't know why Clearwater, <laughs> but... It's a beautiful place. There's a guy with uh, infectious disease radio, sh an hour every Saturday at in noon. Clearwater? Yeah. Wow, okay. It's online and also it's an AM station. Okay. A little great. So well, I'll, have to, um, I'll have to look into he, that. Uh, he said, "I want you to come on once a month and talk about what you write about on your blog." So I do it. That's fantastic. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it's not, it's well, not about me. It's about yeah. That's okay. <laughs> that's you, yeah. That's so you where moved I was. To Clearwater. Yeah, that's where I was raised. So high school. That's right. Elementary school, middle school, high school, okay. and I attended Florida State University for Just my bachelor's degree in Tallahassee, right? Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah, not the one in Gainesville. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the University, that's of, University Florida. of Florida. That's University of Florida. That's correct. Um, uh, thereafter, I went immediately to graduate school at Vanderbilt University, where I um, received my PhD in microbiology and immunology, studying coronaviruses with Mark Dennison. Mm -hmm. I know Mark um, very well. Yes, and uh, I then took a year sabbatical as an eighth grade science teacher, thinking that science was too hard. I was gonna, I was gonna be an eighth grade science teacher, oh. and then I said, "Oh my goodness, science is easy," because <laughs> eighth grade science too teaching hard. is actually very difficult. So, so um, out of your PhD, you went right into eighth grade teaching. That's right. So, uh, I got married in graduate school. Mm -hmm. I met my husband Paul. Um, he was also a graduate student at Vanderbilt, and uh, he was finishing up his PhD. So, we had about a year before we decided where, you know, where we we're gonna go next. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, well, I could stay on and be a postdoc for a year or, you know, I was always really passionate about science communication, science education, and then yeah. there was this job opportunity to teach eighth grade, eighth grade chemistry and physics. So you can just do that? You don't have to get a certificate? It was or? a private school. Oh, you can yeah. just go at a private okay. school, you can, yeah. In fact, they needed people who had science degrees to teach, so. Um, so you went in and taught chemistry? And I did, chemistry and physics to eighth graders who, you know, aren't really enthusiastic about mm. chemistry and physics yeah, and are more enthusiastic about other, you know, social emotional changes going on in their lives. Um, Nonetheless, it, w it was really, it, it was a great experience and, um, you know, definitely solidified that I, I love teaching, I love science, but I probably am better suited back at the bench. Um, you know, you are exactly, well, not maybe you, but PhDs are what we need teaching exactly. kids, pe people who have had some science experience, right. because otherwise the teachers are just reading it from a book and saying, this is what an atom is, or this is what DNA is, and there's no passion. That's right. right, and in fact, the curriculum as it was set up was just that. It was yeah, science yeah. from the book, and I was the first to come and do experiments with them to set up the, the chemistry lab, to buy the chemicals, to set up the physics labs. And of course, they love it, and they learn so much more when it's hands-on, but it's an incredible amount of work hmm. um, to teach the correct yeah. way. To teach that way is an incredible amount of work. So many, many hours are spent you know, developing yeah, those yeah. labs and making sure that they're you know, age-appropriate for the students and that it, it matches up with their other curriculum. Um, so my, my husband got a job offer. He, he left the bench and became a consultant, a science and technology consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton. And that made us move to DC, mm -hmm. which is great mm -hmm. because that's where the NIH is. And so I then um, pursued my, my postdoc for mm -hmm. five years with John Patton at okay. the NIH right. studying rotaviruses. And then after that, you came right here. And after that, this I came your right first, here. This is my so first So you're a job. relatively newly minted professor, that's right? That's right. In, in July, I'll be here three years. Maybe afterwards so. we can have you give advice to all those out there. 
at their early stages of their careers. Right. right. Maybe just hang on. <laughs> just, just well, there are hang lots on of, tight. <laughs> there are lots of pathways to getting where you want to go, obviously. Right. right. You don't have to have a direct path. In fact, I didn't have a direct path at all. Um, and if you listen to, well, this is going to be 285, but if you listen to 278, actually, which is going to be released this weekend, I got interviewed by other people for the podcast, and that I told my career story. So, yeah. But you will have already heard that by now. So it's weird that we're doing this before that. Anyway, XJ, I want to talk about your viruses. I don't know anyone who works with so many different viruses as you. You are really... Well, I, I've never seen it. Usually they tell you to focus on one, but you work on many, uh, right? I, you're right. You know, it's, it's, can help. I, I like I like a virus. Yeah. So as soon as you see a new one, you want to work with it. Right? I mean, it's, you know, whenever there's an emerging virus, especially uh, in pigs, I want to get my hands on it. Yeah, I just can't help. Yeah, Is that so, because of your experience in Iowa? Right? Largely, yes. You know, I, I did get an, uh, you know, I was trained as a physician, yeah, and so I do have the sense of. Uh, I look at things from the clinical point of views, mm. and and uh, especially some of those emerging pathogen in animals, they cause devastating disease. I mean, some of the viruses we work in the lab, uh, they are economically very important pathogens in swine population. But some of them also cause uh, disease in human, mm -hmm. and, and like the hepatitis C virus we're working in the lab, and they are zoonotic pathogen. So. We, I do work on multiple virus system in the lab. I actually work on five different viruses. Uh, all of them are emerging or re-emerging viruses. And all of them cause uh, economically a very important disease in the swine industry. And the first virus uh, we've been working on for many years is the hepatitis E virus. Uh, of course, this is the important human pathogens. And uh, there's a high mortality uh, during pregnancy, actually uh, uh, up to 20 to 25 percent of the infected uh, women uh, uh, during the th third trimester actually die from a hepatitis C virus infection. So it's a serious disease, mostly in developing countries, yeah, but we do have the disease here in the United States. Uh, so, uh, so we are using uh, a two animal virus as a model system, trying to understand the pathogenesis and, and the cross species infection of the hepatitis C virus. So, Hepi is um, an RNA virus, plus stranded RNA virus. When, when, when was it discovered, roughly? Uh, so in the eighties, by an, uh, an a scientist called Michael Bellion, and uh, he is a very n a good virologist from Russia. And, uh, oh, and I remember him. He always had a toothpick in his mouth. Right, right. and yes. uh, he unfortunately yes. passed away uh, some years ago. And actually, he, uh, yes. uh, you know, he, he's, uh, he's, he's the one that identified the virus using the EM, found the virus-like particle. He was able to transmit the virus to rhesus macaques. Didn't he drink it himself? You are absolutely right. I don't know if I can see this. Uh, I've heard this story all uh, over the place. Yeah, I don't know if I can see here, but but you are right. Yeah, he <laughs> did. Uh, he actually uh, drank the stew, actually, mixed with the yogurt, and so he ate it himself, and he developed hepatitis. And yep. So it's a very, uh, I mean, you know, that kind of sacrifice is really, really speaks something about uh, his character. Uh, so he's the one was credited. And also Bob Purcell, actually, mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work, work actually, uh, and he's also the one is considered as the one that uh, uh, responsible for the discovery of the virus. Also, he did some of the ser early serological work that led to the distinction between the hepatitis E virus and the hepatitis A. Because in, in, before that, everybody thought all the hepatitis, especially acute hepatitis, is caused by hepatitis A mm -hmm. virus. Right, uh, but. Uh, that study, I think, published in Lancet back in the 80s uh, from Bob Purcell's group show uh, there is an antigenic different virus called acute enteric transmitted hepatitis, and that is the hepatitis E. So we can't culture this virus? Uh, we cannot culture the virus efficiently. Um, uh, we do have a system now in the lab uh, that was developed actually by Sue Emerson at the NIH, and so we were able to get her system here in the lab. So we can grow the virus, but it's a very low titer, and we can only grow in a particular strain of the virus. Okay. Uh, so not all strain of uh, the hepatitis C virus. So give us an, an idea of the 
global burden of Hep E? It is uh, annually. I can't remember exact the number on top of my head, but somewhere around two million people get infected by the hepatitis U virus. Okay. Now it doesn't mean they all develop disease, and because the vast majority of them are subclinical infections, uh, and, uh, and but you know. Two million dollars, two million uh, people. That's a lot of uh, infections. And in the U.S. In the U.S., uh, I think the hepatitis e is kind of a underdiagnosed because we don't look for this virus. There's no FDA-approved diagnosis test in the U.S., and the hospital typically do not look for this virus. Yeah, and so it is underdiagnosed. We only have a few sporadic cases confirmed in the United States. So it's, it's not a whole lot here in the U.S. All right, so what is the disease course? It's an acute disease, so it's it over is relatively acute, quickly? Uh, in general, this is an acute self-limiting disease, and uh, typically you have an uh, incubation period somewhere from two weeks to up to two months, mm -hmm. and then patients recover and develop pretty much lifelong immunity. However, uh, in recent years, uh, there has been a lot of report, actually, mostly from Europe, uh, they report patients with chronic hepatitis E mm. virus infection. The majority of those individuals are organ transplant recipients. Uh, so it's not just an acute infection. Uh, the virus also causes chronic persistent infection. So these are immunosuppressed people? They are immunosuppressed. Yeah. And they are, uh, you know, uh, organ transplant recipients, they are receiving immunosuppressive regimen treatment. Okay. So how, does, how is it acquired by contaminated materials? Uh, the, right now, we do not know the exact source of the infection in those individuals, but one of the hypotheses is that uh, the pork products, mm -hmm. and, and the, normally if you're an immunocompetent individual, when you're eating the contaminated pork, you do not get infected or you get in a subclinical infection. However, in those immunocompromised individuals, and when they immunosuppressed, uh, if they consume the, uh, contaminated pro products, they could get infected and develop chronic hepatitis E. Mm -hmm. But that just in the theory, uh, and there's no one has directly approved of that. Okay, so then you ingest the virus and it goes to your liver and, and replicates there, is that the idea? Well, yes, and the virus actually uh, uh, we have done some study earlier trying to locate exactly where the virus replicate. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just believe the virus replicate in the hepatocytes. However, we can't find uh, a virus in the hepatocytes at all. I mean, we found a very small amount of viral antigen in the hepatocytes. In people, so, you mean? Right. So the general belief is the virus replicate in bio duct epithelial cells and also in the epithelial cells of G GI tract. And we believe actually the hepatitis is caused by an immune mediated event. And, but again, this is a theory. Uh, no one has approved okay. that. Okay. So, aside, are people the reservoir of hepatitis E? Or? Uh, the animal is the reservoir. Now, there are several different genotypes. Uh, the genotype 3 and the genotype 4, uh, they do have animal reservoirs. Uh, we mentioned about the pigs, it's the reservoir for genotype 3, genotype 4. And, and also rabbit is a reservoir also. Uh, at least we believe that's the case. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, do we but, acquire it from eating rabbit too? Uh, we do not know. And this one of the study actually we are thinking of doing it. One of the students sitting here, we're, we're actually thinking of doing that, looking at some of the uh, rabbit uh, meat in the, in the market and to mm. see if they would be contaminated by the hepatitis C virus. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, my understanding is it's not that easy to, to find those uh, supermarkets that sell rabbit meat. Well, my here. daughter has a pet rabbit that I would love to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would work. I always the, threaten to eat it, but well, that's I mean, not the, if it has happy. The, the sample size is too small for that. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> um, and can it be passed from person to person as well? Uh, it does, but it's in very, very rare cases. And okay. They're not transmitted efficiently from uh, a human to humans. And, uh, so. so what in your work on the virus, You've worked on it for many years. What are you trying to do now? Right now, we have several uh, projects, and one of them we try to develop a chronic hepatitis C infection model. Uh, mm -hmm. because I think that's going to be very important for us to test drugs, and, and you have to have an animal model to test those antiviral drugs. Uh, so we're working to develop a, 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 a pig model system uh, that can mimic the chronic hepatitis C virus infection that we see in those organ transplant recipients. Uh, so basically, we're, we're trying to uh, administer 
immunosuppressive drugs, uh, prednisolin, cyclosporine, and, and, and then we'll infect immunosuppressed uh, pigs uh, to see if they will develop chronic hepatitis E. Uh, so this is one of the projects we're doing. The other project we're doing is that we we'll try to look at some of the genetic element that determine the cross-species infection. And uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, some strains, some genotype like genotype three, genotype four, they do cross-species variant infect humans. So we want to see what control the tissue tropism, why make them jump species and infect humans. Uh, so we we'll make a lot of a chimeric virus between uh, the genotype one, which infect only human and the genotype 3, which infect human, pigs, and a number of other animal species. And then we we'll test them in different animal species to see what genetic element determine the host range and the tropisms. So in, when it infects pigs and rabbits and what else, do they get sick? Uh, they generally do not. They actually, especially in the pigs, uh, here in the state, about 80% of the pigs are infected by the hepatitis C virus. Pigs but on farms? In farms, and, 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 but they do not develop clinical disease. And now, it's fine to eat this meat? No? It is fine to eat if you cook it. And uh, so that's the, that's the, uh, you know, that's the problem. Uh, we done a study a few years ago. One of the uh, grad students in the lab did the study. Actually, we look at some of the uh, pig liver sold in local grocery store here in Blacksburg, and we found about 11 percent of those pig liver are contaminated by the hepatitis wow. E virus, and they are infectious. Uh, they are we not only detect the RNA, but the virus are still infectious when we inoculate uh, the homogenate of those liver back into the animals. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so, so, so there, there are uh, uh, you know if you don't cook the meat properly, uh, yeah. they could infect humans. So I have, I have another podcast called This Week in Parasitism, and my co-host is a parasitologist, and he used to work on trichinella. And he tells me that it doesn't matter if you cook the pork, because if you just freeze it, it will kill the trichinella. It's all you have to do. So he said, you can have rare pork now, but now I'm going to tell him about hep E, because you shouldn't eat rare pork, right? You should not, and, and, and that student, uh, actually, she went on, uh, uh, did a follow-up study. And actually, this is the student actually doing a postdoc right now in Mount Sinai, actually. It was one of your, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Bassler's lab mm -hmm. there now. And she actually went on, did a follow-up study. She actually cooked those contaminated pork with different cooking methods, actually. Mm -hmm. Stir-fry, boiling, and also, <laughs> I think she put in a 56 degree for one hour, that would mimic the medium to rare cooking yeah. condition in a restaurant. And she found those that 56 degree for one hour incubation does not inactivate the virus. So that means if you go wow. to the restaurant, have a medium to rare cooked pork products, and if that pork is contaminated, you are possibly going to get infected by the virus. But even if you buy it and bring it home and you unwrap it and your hands are going to get contaminated, if you're not careful, you're going to... I mean, the cutting board, the knives, all that can be contaminated. It's the same thing with bacteria that are, that are on chicken, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. So you should exercise caution because the FDA does not prevent the sale of pork with hepatitis E. That's what you're saying. That's right? definitely for sure. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. You guys knew that? Yeah, you must. Who works on hep E? You guys do. Is he saying the right things? <laughs> well, they can't see. No. They can't see now in front of me, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, unless they have a death wish. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I move on to another virus that sure, you work sure, on? Sure. So the vir other viruses that fascinate me are the single-stranded, circular DNA-containing viruses. The circoviruses, right? Right. post sign circovirus. Yeah. And uh, anelloviruses are related, right? That's correct. Anelloviruses, is, uh, so Tocitano is also in a single-stranded circular uh, DNA virus. These are put in two families, though, the circoviridae and, and anelloviridae, That's right? correct. post sign circovirus, they are belong to the circoviridae, and Tocitano virus belong to anelloviridae. Yeah, yeah. So I want to just ask a general question about the genome, which is really, why is there single-stranded, why isn't it double-stranded DNA? Do we have any understanding a of that? Good question. Uh, I, personally, I don't have a clue. I, I mean, the, 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 I, I guess it's, you, know, you would think there would have uh, more advantage was a double-stranded. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, I, I guess maybe because the replication, yeah, and uh, you know, especially their circular genome, and uh, uh, you know, they can replicate through the rooting circle, uh, circle uh, replication mechanism. Also, uh, 
uh, because of their circular genome, and I, and I guess their their genome alone, if you can introduce the genome into, let's say, in a, in a cell, mm -hmm. they will be able to replicate and self-replicate. Uh, but whether, you know, the, the, why, the, why they know. have the single strand, I have no idea. So I, I heard a talk by a plant virologist mm -hmm. who works on single-stranded circular DNA viruses of plants, and she said the mutation rate is actually higher for single-stranded DNA. I see nodding. Is that right? That's yes. correct. For circle virus, that is true. Actually, true. true yeah. Also, so mm -hmm. the so the mutation rate for circle virus is higher than for double stranded, like SV40 with the double stranded DNA. They're DNA. almost similar to some of the RNA viruses. Really? Yeah. yeah do we understand why that? We that don't is? know. We we do not know at all. Yeah, and uh, you know that's one of the problems. Is, hmm. You know, for the circle virus, uh, most of the study because of veteran pathogen, most yeah. of the studies focus on vaccine development. And, right. You know, because economic impact of pathogen. There's not a whole lot of basic science, you know, basic understanding of the molecular biology of the virus, and largely because of the phony situations. So mm. we have many, many unknown about this class of viruses. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to ask is when this DNA gets into the cell, so I tell my students in my class, with DNA virus, the first thing that has to happen is the DNA has to be transcribed and make a protein, like an origin-binding protein or something, to get replication going. But circoviruses have to be repaired first. Is that right? Because uh, they're single-stranded. How do they get made double-stranded so they can be transcribed? Well, they're not the game. For post-sense circulation, there's <laughs> really not a whole lot of them now. No. And, and most, you know, you're, you, you can probably drive some uh, uh, commonality from other viruses. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, in this case, we do not know. Uh, all we know, we could derive something from the adenovirus, and, and you would assume they would repair, and they would have, uh, uh, you know, the nick, and then they would transcribe the second strand, and, and then the nucleus would pr produce another nick, and they serve as a primer, and produce the second strand. But for post circle virus, there's a very, very few study, okay. and all we know is a rolling cycle replication. And other than that, there's not a whole lot of known about it. But that, as soon as it goes, it goes in the nucleus, I presume. That's true, that's correct. And it's probably repaired by DNA repair enzymes. It's not polymerases per se, right? No, no. And then once it's double-stranded, it can be transcribed, and then messenger RNAs can be made so that you have to make a rep protein, I presume. That's correct. And there's a rep protein, also a spliced rep protein, a rep yeah. prime, and, and, and that is the replicates of the virus. So these are, these are some of the smallest... Uh, known viruses at 1.7 kb, right? Circle virus is the smallest, actually, uh, uh, animal viruses. And how many proteins do they encode? It's only one uh, structure protein. Makes the a cap capsid, right? Capsid, that's the only one. Uh, Doesn't even have an origin binding protein. Is there an origin? There is one, but I don't think anybody has found that yet. <laughs> there has to have origin binding protein. And so there's only one capsid protein, which makes the vaccine development very, very easy. Yeah. And because you only have one protein, uh, you know that mm -hmm. protein is going to be protective, uh, and uh, so maybe the uh, capsid is also the origin binding protein. It could be, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and again, okay. no one has a look at that. So porcine circoviruses are important pathogens. Again, like uh, the hep. Um, what was the other one we just talked about? The the first post reproductive. Yes. Response. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Post circoviruses type two is right now is one of the most economically important pathogen in the swine industry, and uh, they have done an estimate. I think in the United States, uh, the PCV two virus costs about four hundred million dollars per year in the U.S. alone to the swine industry, and the first virus costs about six hundred million dollar a year in the U.S. alone. So there are, you know, major, major pathogens. And uh, these two viruses alone is more than a billion dollars in losses each year in the U.S. alone. And that's, you know, just in the United States. And these are just, these are porcine-specific viruses, or they go to other animals? These well? two viruses, they are known to infect pigs only. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you know, as a virologist, you never, uh, you know, count out the potential mutation yeah. and jump species. Yeah, in the future, so. So how would they go? How would these viruses go from one farm to another, for example? And uh, the circle virus is very difficult to inactivate. One of the, you know, it's kind of like a power virus. It's notoriously difficult to inactivate. Uh, so they survive in, uh, you know, the soil. The the, the fish pig feces would contaminate uh, the, you know, the vehicle, the transportation vehicles for okay. pigs, and the fomites, and and the boat you wear uh, on the farms. 
so they easily can transmit from farm to farm and, and cause the spread of the virus. So when the farmer has this discovered on his or her farm, it's a bad news because it's going to pass through the, the herd quickly, right? And they can pass through the herd quickly and also going to be difficult for them to get rid of the yeah. virus because of the, the highly resistant nature of this class of virus. Is there a vaccine? Uh, yes, actually, we developed a vaccine a few years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, we licensed to uh, Pfizer and back in 2006. Uh, the vaccine is right now worldwide, I think it's in more than 50 countries right now, and it, uh, the vaccine is doing its job right now. So this is how a farmer should go, it should immunize the herd with uh, your, your vaccine, right? Uh, or my competitors' vaccines. Okay. I don't want to no, we don't uh, want their promote, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there, there, are, there are a couple of competitors also. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the majority of the farm now, uh, today, are vaccinated against the post sensor virus. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, two, two things. One, a couple of years ago, there was a story out of China, dead pigs floating down the Shanghai River, and they got porcine circoviruses yeah. from... What's the story there? I never uh, resolved that. Yeah, I actually talked to a good friend of mine, actually, in Hong Kong, Fred Liang, and I think he did an interview with the CNA on this mm. story. And, and, and it is a combination, not just circle virus. And in China, there's a number of other highly pathogenic viruses in pigs. And so he believed it is a combination of a post and circle virus and other viruses, such as a classical swine fever virus and, and, and uh, uh, you know, post and reproductive respiratory syndrome virus. So when there's a co-infection, they cause uh, a much more severe disease in pigs. And circle virus do not kill pigs. Mm -hmm. uh, they cause the so-called post-venial multi-system visiting syndrome. Essentially, if the pig is infected by the virus, uh, they will not grow as fast as other pigs, and they lose yeah. weight. So they do not kill the pigs. So the fact they see all the pigs die, uh, that would indicate it's not caused by the circle okay. virus. Okay. So um, do these ever infect people, these porcine circle viruses? Uh, they do not, and there are some study in vitro show that the post circle virus can infect human cells, uh, but there's mm -hmm. no evidence that this virus infects humans. And you're probably aware of the, uh, a few years ago, there's a uh, contamination of the rotavirus vaccine with this particular virus, post right. circle virus. So there are some concern about potential human infections, uh, but so far there's no evidence of mm -hmm. human infection by this pig virus. And in fact, that vaccine was taken off the market briefly because of this circovirus, but then it was put back on when it was realized that probably it doesn't constitute a threat. That's, That's right. right. And I think you had to, you testify. Well, yeah, yes. Yeah, so I was on, on the, mm -hmm. uh, representing the couple of uh, uh, the vaccine mm -hmm. uh, makers, manufacturers that uh, was testifying uh, uh, in front of the FD panel there. Right. Yeah. Now, the, on the other hand, the anelloviruses do infect people. Right? Uh, virus do, uh, there's a human talcatainal virus to infect uh, people. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, the, uh, there's a, they do not know what disease they cause. But this post-sign analog virus, uh, post-sign mm -hmm. talcatainal virus, actually they call it tachytonia sus virus, S-U-S virus. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that virus would believe only infect pigs. And, and, and no one has shown that virus infect human. But human analog virus do infect uh, people. But, but we don't know of any human uh, anelovirus-associated disease, right? No. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, speculation. There are some uh, potential correlation uh, to even, you know, autoimmune disease, uh, can even cancer, but no one has definitively uh, demonstrated the causal relationship for uh, some of the anelovirus. But, but a huge fraction of the human population is seropositive for these small viruses, and if you deep sequence blood, you, this is what Eric Delwart tells me, this is the main virus you find. That's exactly people. correct. Yeah, Eric and the UCSF, and the, uh, I can't remember the number, at least 30% of the human have the anelovirus, and mm -hmm. so you can find it if you just draw the blood from um, you know, randomly from individuals, and you're gonna find the virus. And, and they're apparently to be a harmless virus, but you never know. Maybe it's beneficial. Could be, it could be. And, uh, I'm hoping. <laughs> and we're actually exploring, actually using uh, uh, you know, some of these smaller virus to see if we can use as a vector for mm -hmm. vaccine, because they're ubiquitous and, and they're kind of harmful. And uh, so we'll see if that mm -hmm. would work.
So with the uh, porcine circoviruses, what, are, are you working on them at the moment in the lab? We still do. We still have, uh, I think, two uh, individuals working on, uh, on the virus. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, we're trying to develop a second-generation vaccine, a special marker vaccine. And, and so that's our go right now. So what the one you developed, the vaccine you developed, which is used, what's the basis? Is that a virus-like particle vaccine? Uh, that is actually a killed vaccine that is based on attenuated chimeric virus. Uh, you know, there's a two type of post circle virus, the type 1 called PCV1, which is not pathogenic, and type 2, uh, which has caused this disease, devastating disease. So we were able to swap the capsid protein Mm -hmm. from these two mm -hmm. virus, and we generated the chimeric virus, we call it PCB12. Uh, this chimeric virus is attenuated. Uh, so we use that as the vaccine, and we first produced, of course, the, uh, the killed vaccines. Uh, we are still trying to put uh, the modified live vaccine on the market, and that's not very easy. And uh, you have to go through all the regulatory agency to get that. But the killed vaccines are already on the market for six years now. Isn't it easier to get a veterinary product, a biological, on the market uh, than a human not product? Not necessarily. It may be a little bit easier, but not necessarily. You still have to go through a you know, very rigorous uh, uh, USD uh, mm -hmm. uh, license. Uh, uh, you have to do uh, clinical process. trials? You have to do clinical trials. You have to do toxicity study. You have to do all the things that we do for human products, drug and vaccine in humans. But they don't have to sign a consent form. Uh, well, you know, the animal can't sign anything. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, so you're saying it's marginally easier than human licensing. Well, I, think I, I always thought that it would be a piece of cake. Oh, no. I was going to tell our listeners, if you want to do virology, do veterinary no, virology. There's, you know, the safety, maybe the safety is not a top priority yeah. and, uh, compared to the human vaccine, but the safety is, 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 safety is okay. still very important. Now, the cost, though, for the veterinary vaccine is, is critical, and especially mm -hmm. some of those uh, like a poultry vaccine. Uh, and, and, you know, and a fraction of a cent make a huge difference yeah. because yeah. of the large number of animals. Right. Yeah. Right. Every year there are millions of animals, basically, for the poultry vaccine. That's right? correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a much bigger market than human vaccines, actually, because a lot of companies complain about the small market. Once you get one vaccine, that's it for your life. But new chicken every year, right? That's true. Uh, the other virus I wanted to ask you about was is this new one that's appeared in the U.S., the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which you published on not too long ago in MBio. Uh, that's correct. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, that's the new toy we have in the lab, actually. And, uh, <laughs> so wait, wait, as soon as this appeared in the U.S., you jumped on it? Yes, yeah, that... I told you, I, I just can't, I can't help. And I just, uh, you know, I just, just, just... Addicted uh, to pig you know, just, viruses. <laughs> yeah, I just can't well, help. That's a good yeah. title. <laughs> <laughs> I can't uh, help myself. Yeah, so, th so this virus actually, uh, it's not a new virus. Uh, this virus has been, uh, in other parts of the world, has mm -hmm. been uh, endemic in Europe, uh, Asia uh, for many years since I think in the, in the late 70s. Uh, but it's a pig virus, right? It's a pig virus and it's an alpha coronavirus. And, uh, but here in the US, we never see this virus before. And I remember last year teaching a veterinary virology class. I remember last year I tell the class, this is an exotic virus and so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, then last May, and, and the virus first appeared in the United States. Uh, just a few months now, I think it's more than 20 some state has reported cases of a PEDV infections. Uh, so the virus spread quickly around the countries. It's a deadly disease, actually. Uh, it affects very young piglets, uh, usually uh, uh, younger than 10 days of age. Uh, if the pig infected uh, before uh, 10 days of age, uh, essentially 100% of them can die from mm. diarrhea. And the main symptoms is watery diarrhea and leading to dehydration. In many ways, uh, like a rotavirus. So uh, leading to dehydration and death uh, of those piglets. Uh, so it's a devastating disease. Uh, so we started actually immediately after we learned outbreaks in, in, in the United States. Uh, and uh, one of the former postdocs, uh, uh, who is now a professor at not institutions, uh, he started this project, and we're, we want to look at why we have this sudden emergence of this virus in the United States, and, because we never see this before. Uh, so we're trying to track the origin of the virus, and uh, we were able to uh, characterize, I think, uh, uh, six different strains of virus, four from Minnesota and two from Iowa, and we collect samples from the pig farms uh, uh, in Minnesota and Iowa. 
uh, we were able to look at the pathology uh, uh, of the infected pigs, and also we were able to determine the complete sequence of these six strains of virus. Uh, we perform, of course, all the genetic analysis, and uh, we were able to show that this new emergence of PEDV in the United States likely come from China. And especially in the outbreaks uh, in 2010 in China, because this virus shared 99% sequence identity to the stream from an Anhui province in China. Uh, so, so that that uh, you know, how does the virus come here? We have no clue. There's no pig trade between China and the There's US. There's no now. pig trade, and but uh, you know, the, there are some other things, uh, maybe the pork products and some other. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we do import some of the spare part, I believe, and uh, uh, from Asia. And, uh, but hmm. you know, right now we don't know how the virus get it, but our genetic analysis show the virus most likely originated from China. And, and uh, based on the follow genetically, also we did in the uh, molecular clock analysis, and they all indicate the virus originated hmm. from China. So, so this um, is now in Canada, I think. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. The virus is spreading actually like crazy in the last few months, and it's a very difficult to control. And, uh, and, and as I said, more than twenty states have the virus, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, as a coronavirus, you would think the virus is easier to get rid of. Sure. They would not Envelope. survive in the yeah. environment for a longer period of time. But for this virus, they spread very easily, and, and right now. Uh, the general belief is that the virus is spread through uh, some of the transportation vehicle for pigs, mm -hmm. and they use the transport pig from one farm to another farm. You know, they don't wash the trucks very well, and uh, so that probably the major hmm. route of transmission between farms. All these viruses we've talked about that infect pigs are they all causing GI infections? Uh, for this virus, yes, and the, for the circle virus, they also they also cause diarrhea. They cause GI. Okay. Uh, 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 and the other virus we're working on the the PERS virus, which is arterial virus, they primarily cause respiratory, respiratory. tract disease. Okay, yeah. so is there for the porcine epidemic, is there a vaccine for this? Uh, there is a vaccine in Asia, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there's a vaccine that's been used for many years in Korea and China. Uh, my understanding is the vaccine is not doing very well, which mm -hmm. is, as you know, coronavirus is notorious, and there's not very good vaccine for mm -hmm. coronavirus. Uh, there's no vaccine in the United States, and several company uh, has been trying to develop vaccine. There's a one small company, Ames, Iowa, has developed a vaccine, but it's not USD licensed. Uh, I think they got a conditional USD approval to distribute the vaccine. Uh, we don't know uh, the efficacy of the vaccine, but it has been used. Uh, you know, in an emergency situation like this, mm -hmm, the USD mm -hmm. do give you the condition approval so that you can sell the vaccine to stop the spread. Okay. Uh, but there's no USD licensed vaccine as of now. Is that something you want to work on? Uh, there's something we are planning to do. Actually, we are uh, uh, having a project now. We're trying to uh, uh, secure the funding uh, to develop vaccine against this disease. Uh, it's a very important disease. We definitely need a vaccine. Okay. So before we move on to Sarah, I wanted to ask you one last thing, which is sort of a career question. Um, you, you might be the first veterinary virologist on TWIV. Is it okay if I call you that? Of course. <laughs> Does, can you, you call me the, Are you a card-carrying veterinary virologist? Uh, I'm not a card-carrying, <laughs> but I am. A, I think you can classify me as okay. a veterinary virologist. Yeah, so, yeah. so just talk a little bit about the field compared to the rest of virology, and should people thinking about going into virology consider it? Definitely. I think that's, that's one of the fields I think is, uh, uh, we don't get a lot of publicity. There's a many tremendous, I mean, the wonderful, great veterinary virologists in the field. Uh, many of them, you know, there's uh, just... Linda Safe, on top of my mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Fantastic veterinary virologist. But sometimes, because of the type of work they do, they don't get all this published and everything because they work on the animal pathogen. And, right. and, and, uh, so it, it is in a very important field, and we need veterinary virologists. And, and uh, you know, think about this. More than 70% of a human emerging infectious disease come from animals. And so you know, if we have those veterinary virologists or veterinary bacteriologists, uh, we can stop those infection in the animal population before they jump species. Uh, so I think I think this is very very important and, and to to uh, 
you know, to have this this uh, uh, veterinary virology community, uh, you know, have more uh, students actually um, join the this community, and, and it's it's just a uh, with right now still very small um, group, and compared to the human virology, and and and. Uh, uh, but but you know I have no no regret. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah. Even though I can't convince my mom, and uh, every time I <laughs> see, I see her, and I remember the last time I see her, and she would ask me, and I send you to medical school. Are you still working <laughs> with the pigs and the chickens? <laughs> and, uh, and I said yes, and I'm still working with pigs and chickens. And, but but it, it, it is a you know it's, it's a wonderful field. You send her your M bio paper, you know. I guess that doesn't. Count for much. That, 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 that <laughs> probably, yeah. Uh, that will probably, yeah. Uh, uh, but do t tell him that I have an agent, uh, not agent, I have secondary appointment in the medical school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, right. well, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's a great field and underrepresented and uh, a lot of opportunity. I think you couldn't probably work on every human virus that interested you. It's really hard to do, but you can do this uh, quite readily with viruses that infect animals. That's true. So. And then you have this, you know, naturally occurring animal model system. You yeah. can always, you know, once you do uh, some of the genetic m manipulation in the lab, you can always right. test he, the And here's the thing. It's the virus and its natural host. That's correct. Whereas in human viruses, we're always putting them in unnatural hosts, right? Mice or ferrets or whatever. It's just, and you always have this qualification about the results, but you can study the virus where it uh, is causing disease or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah, let's talk about rotaviruses. Sure. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, we haven't had a rotavirologist on TWIV, so now is your chance to tell us all about it as well as, as what you're doing. Sure. So tell, give us a, a feel for the global importance of rotavirus infections. Well, before I talk about the global importance of rotavirus, I think the statistic that was most shocking to me when I first learned about childhood mortality is that um, you know, the, really the number one killer of children aged one month to 59 months, so not neo, neonates, but um, babies older than one month worldwide is diarrheal diseases. Um, so kids really are dying from diarrhea. Of course, most of the kids who are dying are in um, regions of the world that have less access to medical care. So in the United States, if, you know, my son gets diarrhea and it's so bad that Pedialyte mm. isn't going to mm -hmm. be sufficient, I take him to the emergency right. room and he gets IV fluids and survives. But of course, if you're um, not near a hospital and don't have access to that type of care, uh, essentially the kids are dying from, from dehydration. Um, and of that diarrheal disease, really the number one viral cause of diarrhea in children this age is rotavirus. So the, the last statistics, um, and this is really pre-worldwide vaccine rollout, is that um, approximately half a million kids each year are dying from rotavirus-induced diarrheal disease. So the, um, the global morbidity and mortality of rotavirus is incredibly significant. Um, and I'll, I'll say that, you know, it, it doesn't matter where you live, mm -hmm. you're going to get a rotavirus infection at some point in your life. All of us as children had rotavirus infections, probably several. Um, we just are fortunate to be able to recover from them. So in the, after the, before the vaccine in the U.S., there was still a mortality from not as much as elsewhere, but kids still died. Right. right. There was there was still some mortality. It was low. I'd say about 40, 40 kids per year in the United mm -hmm. States. But the incidence of the disease was extremely high. And the cost, um, as far as, you know, parental work days loss, cost of emergency room visits. Um, so the financial burden was pretty severe in the United right. States pre-vaccine um, because, you know, if your kid is having um, severe watery diarrhea and vomiting for three to five days, yeah. you know, it's a trip to the emergency room. It's, yep. it's serious. Yeah. So the impact, what's been the impact of the vaccine on the U.S.? The impact has been really tremendous. So the rates of uh, severe rotavirus gastroenteritis have significantly diminished. Now, the vaccine does not protect against all infections. Um, it essentially mimics what would be the first infection a child would receive, which is often the most severe. And so there is kind of an immunity that builds up. So oftentimes there, there will be kids who, who have more moderate or mild mm -hmm. diarrhea, mm -hmm. even if they're vaccinated. That's not, that's not unusual, but of course that's, you know, kids, anyone who's had a kid knows that sometimes they throw <laughs> up and have diarrhea and that's just what happens. Um, but certainly the number of uh, cases of severe diarrhea have, have gone down tremendously. Now there's ongoing epidemiological surveillance, mm -hmm. um, really, the, the CDC has been leading the efforts in the United States. There's a new vaccine surveillance network 
And there are several Sentinel sites that are trying to monitor incidences of acute gastroenteritis, you know, all cases, not just rotavirus, but then doing some um, molecular testing of the samples. And it does look like in some cases, uh, in some sites, I should say, the incidences are on the rise, mm. more, more so over, over the, I guess, the last two years. And uh, it, at Vanderbilt, for example, over the last couple of years, there's, there have been um, cases of older children coming in with severe rotavirus disease, seven, eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So there's questions about whether or not... These um, were immunized kids. These were kids who were immunized. That's right. Is this yeah. because of genetic variation? Or we don't know. Not so sure. That's right. So I think that there, there is definitely the need to have ongoing surveillance for, for rotavirus infections. Um, and of course, in other regions of the world, the vaccine uptake has not been so great. Mm -hmm. So the efficacy has been low. Um, the immune response against the vaccine has been low. There's questions about strain diversity in different regions. So, so there's, there's a possibility that we may need to think of region-specific vaccines for rotaviruses. So uh, if you, as a kid, you get a, your first rota infection is severe, and you will get more as you get older, but That's they right. will be less severe? Less severe, and it's not unheard of for parents of kids who yeah. have an infection to yeah. also have I absolutely got bouts it. of diarrhea. Is it accompanied by vomiting and diarrhea? It can be, yeah, yeah. Yep, it absolutely can be, yeah. So it can be a two bucket it disease. It can be, exactly, that's exactly right, yeah. Like norovirus. That's right, yep. Yeah, I did get it from my kids, yeah, yep. for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but why, so even adults can get it into, as long as you're having contact with kids who are infected, yeah? Why yeah. doesn't the immunity protect us? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I think the, the correlates of protection, I think if Liz Juan was here, she, she would probably be able to, to talk a little bit more about yeah. this. Liz Juan Yuan is, is studying uh, rotavirus immunology, correlates of protection from vaccine and natural induced immunity. Clearly, there's, there's heterologous protection, so it's not like, you know, every strain that we see our body mm -hmm. that has to mount a brand new, it's not like the common cold, for example. Yeah. or even influenza where it's like every year yeah. it's completely right. new or different. So there is some heterologous protection, but I'd say it's incomplete. The fact that you can, the, like I said, the vaccine will not prevent you from being in, infected and even shedding the virus. You'll just have a, a more mild mm. disease. It could also yeah. be that mucosal immunity is important and that wanes very quickly. And that's absolutely right. the case. Mucosal immunity, mucosal, the, the only true standard correlate of protection that's been established in humans is, is IgA levels, mm -hmm. anti-rotavirus mm -hmm. IgA levels yeah. in the gut. And my understanding is the memory, uh, memory cells for IgA don't hang around the mucosa very long, so that's a problem as that's well. Right. You know, so. That's right. So you've done some work on what I would call typing, devising tests, and I wonder if you can explain what's a, a group and a genotype and It's very that. confusing. I know, I know. Well, before I say that, let me yeah. just, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how I kind of got into this world of... Sure. Uh, rotavirus genomics. I certainly never thought of myself as an evolutionary virologist or even someone who, you know, really was like, yeah, I'm going to be passionate about classification of rotaviruses. But it was clear to me when I when I started into the field that um, there was very little known about the genetic diversity of rotaviruses, even mm -hmm. human strains. So when I started my postdoc in 2006 with John Patton, there had only been one complete genome sequence of a human rotavirus. Amazing. One in GenBank. And you think about every single kid in the world is getting infection, yeah, infected yeah. with this virus, and half a million kids at least are dying from this disease. Why do we not have more sequences? And so um, in John's lab, I, I collaborated very closely with um, several investigators uh, around the world, including uh, Yellow Mathijensen in, in Belgium. He's been really kind of the leader in this classification field and genome sequencing. But I also helped to establish a sequencing pipeline at the J. Craig Venture Institute to, um, to essentially start to sequence um, some rotaviruses from the stool. And once we started sequencing them, of course, in order to, to compare them and to say that this strain is different from this strain, you need to be able to classify yeah, them in some sure. way. And this is this is kind of what started this genotype, genogroup classification. And, and so Yella, I'll, I'll give him full credit for being kind of the pioneer of that field, but what he was able to do is to move away from um, classic serological mm -hmm. classification, because no yeah. one was doing plaque neutralization reduction assays anymore. I'm sorry, even though I do love plaque assays as well. Um, a lot of people weren't <laughs> doing the, the neutralization assays to really look at serology, yeah. but everyone was sequencing. Sequencing right. had become easy and cheap, and a lot of the molecular epidemiology was based on sequencing. So he established nucleotide percent cutoff values mm -hmm. to start to talk about genotypes 
So rotavirus is a segmented virus, mm -hmm. uh, like influenza. It has um, 11 different RNA segments. And so he was able to establish cutoff values that allowed us to genotype each of the individual RNA segments. And that allowed, allowed us to kind of compare the genotype constellation and say, what does this one uh, look like versus this? Yeah. Makes it complicated because they can reassort. And then they reassort. Yeah. So That's you have right. to do it on a segment level. You'd have to do it on a segment level. That's exactly okay. right. That's exactly right. But once we started doing that, it was almost like a whole world opened up about the mm. biology of the virus, you know, we, and what was even more important, at least for me, was the idea that, you know, we were using simian rotavirus as a mm. model for understanding rotavirus biology. And then when you look at its genome it's, it's constellation. It's like a Terry Dermody imitation, you know, what you just did. It was it? Yeah. <laughs> I knew I was going to do some kind yeah. of, <laughs> I, love, love I said, I'm going to watch this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what weird things I do when I talk. You must have seen um, him often at Vanderbilt. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. Terry and I are very close, yes. <laughs> He's yeah. He's. I still consider him one of my mentors. We did a Twitter. He's a titan. Yeah. I, I I hadn't watched it, but I had saw it. him it's as fun. a list of on the, really as good. a guest. Yeah. yeah. He's he's wonderful. He's coming here in, in April. He's coming next month to talk. Um, but we started to question. You know, are we using the most appropriate model? Yeah. Is this really a model virus for what is infecting and killing kids worldwide? Mm -hmm. You know what? You know what should we be thinking about when we're trying to understand really the biology of the virus? What can the genetics and genomics mm -hmm. tell us? Yeah, so, so tell me what is a genotype and a group? So a genotype <laughs> is, a, a, is, a, is basically a classification based on the nucleotide percent sequence. cutoff value sequence of the gene segment. Okay. okay. So a what, gene you, group, you have to specify the segment when you say right. a genotype. That's right. You're a genotype Because your virus one. can have segment one can be one genotype and eight can be something that's else. That's exactly so right. So you have some kind of nomenclature that includes, okay. That's exotically right. And then the gene right. group will say mm -hmm. what is kind of the overall trend of the segments. Okay. So if they're mostly genotype one genes, mm -hmm. we say they belong to this gene group. If they're mostly okay. genotype two genes, you belong to this other gene group. And uh, I will give a little bit of credit to um, years ago in the in the 80s, uh, the Nakagomis were able to kind of identify this same trend mm -hmm. using RNA hybridization, and they really established this idea of gene. This was even before we did sequencing. sequencing yeah, yeah, that yeah. by RNA hybridization, there were these different gene groups of rotaviruses. So, how many genotypes are there? Oh. At least 11, right? <laughs> Yes. But 11 times what? Well, so for each gene segment, right now, I think the, the most is probably for the, the gene segment that encodes VP4. There's mm -hmm. 37 different genotypes of VP4. Are these globally distributed, or they tend to be geographically localized? They're not, they're, they're not as much geographically localized as they are localized to different animal species okay. or associated okay. with different animal species. So there are certain um, VP, so the outer capsid, proteins are encoded by the genes VP4 and VP7. Mm -hmm. um, those, of course, dictate attachment and entry of the virus, yeah. and um, oftentimes species tropism as well. Right. So there are certain G types that are heavily associated with porcine rotaviruses and very infrequently associated with humans, although never say never, right? Because there's always yeah, a kind of a one-hit wonder that comes out of a a pig genotype infecting a human. Um, there is a little bit of evidence of um, geographical distribution. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the GNP types that are very dominant in the United States are also dominant in other parts of the world, but then there are kind of what we would consider the more unusual ones um, that you might see associated with animal okay. infections do seem to to kind of pop up in the human population more frequently in different parts of the world. So Africa, okay, Southeast Asia is a big... So in humans, how many, roughly how many genotypes would we see? In humans, there are 11 different mm -hmm. G genotypes. There are about four different P genotypes. These are groups, the G and P. Those are the G and P. Okay. But then the rest of the gene segments tend to be either all genotype one or all genotype two. Okay. So if you take that a little bit, a step back to that, that group, gene group, really there are two dominant human rotavirus gene groups. There's what we, we call gene group one, which a lot of people say these are the WA-like viruses because that was a prototypic virus that mm -hmm. was first identified. And then there's a, a DS1-like gene group two virus. Um, now, for the gene group ones, though, the G type of those, so you can be a, a WA like gene group one virus, and, and I say that you change your hat. 
Yeah. But you're still the same virus yeah, yeah, sure. through, through the rest okay. of your genetic backbone, but you have a different G-type. So is there cross-protection between genotypes? That's a great question, and that's, I, I think there's actually kind of an experiment in progress that's going to, I think, tell that, and that's based on the um, components of Rotatech. Which is one of the vaccines, Which is right? one of the vaccines mm -hmm. versus Rotorix, which is the other vaccine. So Rotatech is Merck's vaccine, mm -hmm. Rotorix is uh, GSK, okay. and Rotorix is a monovalent vaccine. There's only one G-type, one P-type, right. and then you know one constellation, mm -hmm. if you will, of, of internal protein genes. Uh, Rotatech is a, uh, a multivalent vaccine. It has at least four different G-types in it, as well as one or hmm. two P-types, kind of depending on how you, you say they match up. The data suggests that both are equally effective. <laughs> and, and what has been really tremendous is seeing that Rotorix, which is a G1P8 vaccine, is, pr is protecting very well against heterologous mm -hmm. strains. And, and that was, I think, a little bit you know, controversial in the field whether or not that was going to be the case. Yeah. Certainly Al Kapikian, yeah. who is a titan in the rotavirus vaccine community, would have you know, put his money on, on Rotatech and that you know, GNP, GNP types do really matter. Um, so the simpler vaccine is protecting as well as the that's more exactly complex right. one. And it's protecting right. against heterologous strains. And globally, this is not just in globally. the U.S., right? That's right. Oh, okay. That's right. All right. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. And these are both contaminated with circoviruses, That's exactly right. right. They, and they, and they, <laughs> they still, are. They still continue to be, right? Yeah, you know, the rotavirus vaccine has had so many obstacles. There's intussusception. Right, right. Um, Rotashield, which was originally developed by Alka Picion, was approved. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, out. People were using it. It was working great in the 90s, and then the FDA pulled it because of the uh, epidemiological link with intussusception. And then they reformulated it. It's now Rotatech, and Rotorix came out. And then, of course, people deep sequence the so stocks, and you see that there's circle virus in there. Yeah, and yeah. Thankfully, the you know the FDA decided that it was safe. It's as safe as I guess eating pork from the grocery store, <laughs> um, which I, I I'm, I'm 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 deciding maybe I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I might go vegetarian after this. <laughs> you know, this is it's a live saving vaccine, especially in those developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, diarrhea is a leading cause of death in many developing countries, mm -hmm. and the root of virus causes diarrhea. Yeah, I mean, not diarrhea, de dehydration is leading. Yeah, I mean, That's diarrhea right. causes dehydration, so uh, it's, it's a great way but, but not every preparation of rotavirus has circovirus, and it's just a vaccine, right? Or is that it's just the vaccine? That's yeah. right. So I believe it was tra it was traced to the the trypsin that was used to prepare. And the function I can't comment. Oh, you can't uh, because, comment. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, was, uh, I am a yeah. consultant about those two vaccine manufacturers. I can't comment on okay. some of the things. Yeah. In mean, the yeah. news, it said that it was porcine trypsin, That's right. the source of the circo. So, That's right. I mean, we all use trypsin in our experiments. So That's we must exactly all right. have circoviruses in our stocks, no? Yeah, I don't know if the source of trypsin that we use to culture cells um, and subculture cells is, yeah. is different. But we do, so rotavirus attachment. Mm -hmm. And entry is exquisitely dependent upon proteolytic activation of the viral attachment protein VP4. And so we have to trypsin activate our virus to get it to grow in culture. And we use porcine pancreatic trypsin to do yeah. that, to grow it. And, and likewise, in order to grow the vaccine stocks, you would be doing the same thing. So you my might, understanding might, is that's where it was traced to. So you might have circovirus. This guy knows all the secrets. In your oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure we do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we done a study actually a few years ago. We published actually how uh, we actually look at one of the porcine derived products, pepsin. Mm -hmm. We found both circovirus type one and the type two. Yeah. And, uh, so it's not surprising to find those pig virus in those uh, commercial products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But right. it doesn't mean they're going to infect human though. That's yeah. right. So, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They're there. But in the and lab, it doesn't mean the vaccine is not safe and effective right. and that people should not be using it. I'm just worried in the lab when you yeah. do experiments and you measure things you think are uh, caused by your virus that may be caused by the circle virus. I mean, the, for, for years, That's right. people had mycoplasma in their cell cultures right. and people who worked on DNA viruses, it turned out that a lot of the observations were due to the mycoplasma and right. not to their virus. And that's why it's important to do a true mock control, in yes, which you course. mock activate, you that's know, right. instead of virus, you, right. you activate media with trypsin, and then you use that as your control, so. So, so to this day, you're still interested in the, the variation of rotaviruses, correct? I am, because I think it's, um, it's giving us a lot of insight into the 
biology of the mm -hmm. virus. So if you're able to mine the sequence data for information about the life cycle, the biology, the interactions, I think the virus has a lot to tell us sure. that's imprinted in the genome if you have the tools to look. Now, one of the things you uh, write on your website is that you're interested in reassortment. That's right. So can you tell us how each virion gets one of each of the 11 segments? I wish I could. <laughs> I can tell you my thoughts on one, it. I will, yeah. Let me tell you a quick okay. story. So when I was a graduate student, uh, I was in Peter Palazzi's lab, and they, we were thinking about how flu gets all the right eight segments, right? And one day, Bernie Fields walked in. He was giving a seminar, and he saw Peter. He said, Peter, I have the solution to how real virus packages all the right segments. Now, this is 1977. Okay, so you know, yeah. he, he never had the solution, but right. he thought he did anyway. Yeah. So to this yeah, day, we still I don't know, his ideas that. might be right. I think, you know, it's been, it's <laughs> difficult. It, everyone has the idea. It's difficult to pr perform the experiment, right. to, to have the data that supports your idea. So, so you would like to know. I would love to how, know. How do you, yeah, uh, I'd love that, to know. is this something you're trying to work on? Or, well, um, uh, it's, it's something that's on my, my long list of experiments okay. that I'd like to do. I don't think that we're in position right now to answer those, mainly due to um, experimental difficulties. So having an, an in vitro packaging assay would be instrumental to actually mm -hmm. be able to, to understand it. Um, at the very least, having a reverse genetic system would be would be really important. And for rotaviruses, no, you don't have one yet. We do not have reverse genetics for rotaviruses. But there is for Rio. That's right. Terry Darmody right. was the first to get it to go for the, the real viridae in general, and then for, for mammalian orthoreal virus, mm -hmm. and that was followed very shortly by Polly Roy's lab, who got it to work for blue tongue virus. Mm -hmm. um, both Terry and Polly have tried the, re the rota virus uh, to see if they could get it to work for rota, and it, it doesn't it's work. It's been a tough nut to crack. And Do you we're know not why? Really Do you have any insight? Uh, again, we all have our ideas and thoughts about about why, about what the holdup might be. I think one of the, the biggest breakthroughs, uh, at least for me, came out very recently from Ulrich Dessebarger's lab in Cambridge, in which his, his graduate student did an experiment to look at whether or not plus strand RNAs, um, rotavirus plus strand RNAs, when transfected into cells, are uh, efficiently translated into proteins because we had thought, oh, we'll just do mm -hmm. an RNA launch, you know, yeah, just give it yeah. instead of one, like polio, we'll give it 11 or, you know, yeah. 10 or mm -hmm. depending on, you know, which real viridae you're working on. And compared to the blue tongue virus, RNAs, the rotavirus RNAs were not translated. They were not translated mm -hmm. as far as protein was not detected. And so um, that was kind of a big wake-up call. I said, uh-oh, well, maybe the plus strain RNAs are really efficient replication templates, but at least in the manner that they're given, which is outside the context of an incoming particle, um, they're not efficiently recognized okay. by the host cell translation yeah. machinery. So I think that that's a hurdle that's going to have to become o overcome, or we're going to have to get the proteins in a different way. Okay. So tell us something that you're working on that you're passionate about. So my lab right now, we have three what I think are really exciting projects going on, um, and these all are related to the work that I was doing as a postdoc in John Patton's lab. Um, one of the big projects in the lab is trying to understand how the virus assembles mm -hmm. and how genome replication is coordinated with the early stages of particle assembly. So uh, rotavirus genome replication and our replicase complex is actually a subviral particle right. in which right. you know either at the same time as assortment and packaging or immediately after these 11 different plus strand RNAs are sorted they're packaged into a newly forming core and only once they're intimately associated with this forming core are they replicated in which the polymerase will now create the minus strand copy of that package plus right. strand to make and, the double stranded RNA and these plus strands were originally produced from an incoming virion. That's right. And they came out of the turrets, right? That's right. We don't have turrets. Well, but they came out of some hole at the right. fivefold axis, that's right? That's exactly right. We don't have turrets. We don't have turrets. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Real viruses will have that's turrets. That's another good title. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> no turrets here. But those mRNAs are yeah. translated. Those mRNAs are translated precisely. As opposed to the ones that Desselberger. Precisely, yeah. And if you ask John Patton, he, his hypothesis is perhaps that as the plus strand RNA is extruded from the particle, it's immediately captured by a host cell ribosome and translated, mm. whereby it doesn't have a chance to kind of, you know, misfold or f knot up on itself or trigger some kind of um, antiviral response in the right, host cell. Right, right. There's all kinds of things that you could think of that yeah. why, you know, having a 
it's plastering RNAs floating around in the cytosol might be a bad thing. So it gets, it gets captured pretty quickly. It, that's the idea. Uh, and that's yeah, probably that's an innate evasion mechanism, yeah, right? Yeah, it gets yeah. captured. Yeah, and in fact, so it's not sensed, all yeah. stages of rotavirus RNA synthesis, yep. all Rioviridae, I'd say, are um, particle associated. Right. That's right. right, right. So, so we're interested in understanding kind of on the, on the end, how is assembly coordinated with genome replication? How does the polymerase, quote unquote, know when it's in a, inside of a particle? Right. What is the interaction right. between the core shell that allows it to allosterically act Activate the polymerase and allow it to actually mediate minus strand synthesis. Um, so we have projects involved in um, capturing some of these assembly intermediates mm -hmm. um, biochemically, and then with in a collaboration with my colleague Debbie Kelly at the Virginia Tech Corleone Research Institute, we're um, trying to image some of them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we're doing just the classical uh, molecular dissection of the complex using recombinant approaches, um, you know, baculovirus express proteins right. to look at activation of the polymerase. So th is the polymerase at the uh, five-fold axis as in Rio? That's Same right. Idea? That's right. Just underneath the five-fold is where it's thought to be. And then That's as right. it makes mRNAs in a new infected cell, they come out of the, what do you call it? It's yeah, not a we call them they're the aqueous channels. Uh, the five-fold channels. channels, but there's no... We don't no, have turrets. We, we have don't have turrets, channels. so if you look at the... It's actually kind of a distinguishing feature. There's the turreted rearoviridae mm -hmm. and the non-turreted rearoviridae. Sometimes we fight with each other. No. Um, but the, these turrets are actually, for, for the, the mammalian orthorheovirus, they're made up of the capping enzyme. And uh, as okay, the plus strand okay. RNA is kind of wiggling its way out of capped. the particle, it's capped. Uh, okay. Now, we don't... Our capping enzyme is inside, mm -hmm. so the, the presumably the the polymerase will actually kind of shunt the plus strand RNA over to the capping enzyme, yeah. and then it will kind of wiggle its way out from the particle. But it's it's not known. So that okay. that's actually a little bit related to another project that is ongoing, which is um, st structural dynamics of transcription. And this is a project that started. Um, pretty quickly after I arrived at the, the institute. And again, it's a collaboration with Deb Kelly. And, um, you know, she's interested in um, understanding how to image things using EM microscope. She, she's developing a um, microfluidics platform to look at imaging things in liquid. And she said, oh, I bet we could see your virus pretty well in mm -hmm. liquid. And so um, she's been able to um, create these EM grids that are, she calls them the affinity grid, in which they are layered with antibodies that will actually capture particles. Mm -hmm. And then we are able to capture these, these transcriptionally active DLPs. At that time, we didn't even try the transcription and, and image them in liquid. And I said, oh, well, you know what would be really cool is if we watched them do transcription, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. And yeah. um, what we found is that there's some really cool structural changes that seem to occur within the interior of the core that we were a little mm -hmm. unexpected. It was unexpected what was happening there. So we're, we're just understanding what's happening to the enzymes during transcription, what's happening to the caps and layer dynamics as these plus strand RNAs are, you know, pumped out. Right. And if you, right. you know, if you see how much RNA they make, uh, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely remarkable. And a single particle will transcribe for hours. The template this is, is just in vitro. vitro. Yeah, yeah, the template will recycle. And these are and just, just pump making out, out mRNAs. RNAs. Yeah, And MRNAs. those can be translated if you put them in vitro in a translation system. In vitro, in, in reticulocytes, for example, they translate. are. But not in so if you transfect those into a host cell, you get no detectable protein. It's interesting. Heartbreaking, right? it is. It's very interesting. And can you it's can show that they get in the cell, even. That's right. So, uh, and again, I'll credit Ulrich Dusselberger showed this, and <laughs> and you know he did some quantitation to show that the RNA was not degraded. It was just not. Yeah. You know, it's hard to say. Well, is it not translated or below the level of detection? But it's certainly not efficiently translated mm -hmm, compared mm -hmm. to a, a, blue, a homologous blue tongue virus yeah. plus strand RNA. So something is ha something is different about rotavirus plus strand RNAs. Is the idea? So uh, Ulrich is an old friend of mine. Is he? He and I were well, in Peter Ulrich. Palazzi's lab in the 70s. Okay. So when I was a student, he was a visiting scientist. At the time, he was from Hanover, uh -huh. and then and later he went to the UK. Yeah. Is he still in, in the UK? He's still in the UK. He's at Cambridge. And yep. uh, I still mm -hmm. keep in touch with him. Yeah, and, and he, so still, he does, still does experiments. And I, used to, <laughs> I, used, I used to be his uh, interpreter, actually. Oh, uh, really? He gave him a lecture, I uh, can't remember the year, in the in in mid late 80s in China. Uh -huh. So I was uh, his uh, translator. That's great. To the lecture. That's and, great. Uh, yeah, yeah well, that's he, great. Uh, he, I, he periodically sends me emails and mm -hmm. he. He listens to the podcast. He loves it. 
Hi, Ulrich. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll definitely listen to this one. So that was two. You said you had three ongoing so, right. things. Right. And so right. the the third project is is kind of you know still understanding this comparative genomic project. Okay. And so one of the things that we realized when we started sequencing these these genomes is was this idea of these constellation effects, whereby if a virus was a, a G1P8 virus, it tended to have its quote-unquote internal protein gene segments were all genotype 1. For example, if its polymerase segment was a genotype 1, its VP2 core shelf segment was a genotype 1. And so there was this constellation effect. And what was interesting is that there wasn't a lot of uh, reassortment between these two dominant gene groups of rotaviruses, but yet they would co-circulate in the community. They caused indistinguishable disease. If you co-infect cells. If you co-infect cells, there are so, there's some evidence of reassortment. In fact, we have some projects in the lab that we're trying to understand that, but it's not, um, I say it's not willy-nilly, as in it's not right. as frequent as you would think. And there are certain sets of genes that tend to reassort more frequently than others. Mm -hmm. So there's restrictions on reassortment. There are molecular okay. determinants that restrict reassortment. And so we're trying to uh, piece that apart both within the cell, so what is at the packaging level, why would one segment package over another, as well as at the fitness level of the virus. So right. a reassortant virus, you know, the idea we think about reassortment more frequently in the context of influenza, whereby we see reassortant strains pop up and we think, oh, it must be advantageous for the virus to reassort. And that's true under certain selective pressures, but by and large, if a virus breaks apart these constellations, there are actually fitness consequences for that virus. And so we're, we're testing that idea and we're trying to understand a little bit more about what those consequences are and are they mediated by RNA interactions, protein interactions, you know, what, right. what is the effect when a virus has a mismatched constellation? Yeah, I think that's why? also true to a certain extent for influenza, but not as, it doesn't, I don't think it's as rigid. I remember as a graduate student in Peter's lab, I took two different influenza B isolates, co-infected cells, and I got every conceivable reassortant out of that co-infection. Right. So there was no restriction at all on what segment went That's with right. which. Yeah. But I think in nature there are some, but according, yeah. I suspect they're all generated, but then selection That's gets rid exactly of right. most of them, That's right? exactly right. That's exactly right. I think so, there's, yeah, there's direct determinants of reassortment restriction, which would be that packaging level yeah. defect, and then there's these indirect determinants that are just, you know, this constellation of genes is more favorable. And, yeah, of yeah. course, the further apart you get genetically, the more right. difficult it is. Right. You become right. speciated, and we definitely see that with group A versus group C rotaviruses. They're completely speciated. You could do co-infections all day long and not get a reassortant. Really? That's right, that's right. But then within group A, it was thought that reassortment happened very frequently. And, and I think we were surprised to find that even very closely related viruses mm -hmm. in a single community. So the first study we did was um, these were ar archive we sequenced archival stool specimens that were collected at DC Children's Hospital over the course of 17 years. And we were able to look at what viruses were, you know, uh, causing kids to come into the emergency room with severe disease. So these were kind of wild type pathogenic yep. strains. And we found that even at a single location that the, um, the incidence of reassortment was much less than what we would have predicted, even mm. for strains that belong right. to the same quote unquote gene group. They would be closely related, but you can really see that, in fact, not all combinations work together. Does this also, is this also obscene with rheoviruses? I, I would say yes, but no one's really no one's looking, looked, right? Yeah. So so yeah. no one would have, you know, in 2006, no one would have thought sure. that this was the case with Rhoda either. So, you know, I don't know if there's um, an impetus to do a lot of large-scale comparative genomics for Rio. Well, it does, they don't do many human infections, exactly. right? So there's no exactly. But I bet if to you, isolate. I bet if you did, you would find the same yeah, thing. Right. That's right. And so you mentioned that you're trying to figure out if it's an RNA-RNA or RNA-protein interaction. Or protein-protein. That's, protein. That's there's no information on that at all. We don't know if a segment binds one of the inner shell proteins, for example. It's very difficult, very difficult. So what we're trying to do very right now... Very difficult to do? It's very difficult to analyze the genome, <clears> to try to infer mechanistic information about the genomics data. But what we can do is, and what we're doing is what's called covariation analysis. And what you can do is look at, so at a nucleotide level, you might say if two nucleotides are functionally co-evolving, you would see them changing in multi-sequence yeah. alignments together. Now, because we don't have a lot of really good structural information for RNAs, <laughs> right it becomes very difficult. So we've been focusing on the protein level covariation analysis and it's very intriguing. There are these, you know, software programs that will 
will look at amino acid covariation and, and the strength of that mutual information and say, okay, well, if it's, you know, this, you know, alanine, oh, or this position of, of VP1 always covaries with this position of VP2, and we can infer whether or not those are interaction interfaces and kind of what, you know, what the consequences of these mismatched constellations might be. Can you also do some biochemistry, though? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, that, and so the, the genomics work is uh, discovery-driven hypothesis generating is what I would say. So we mine the data <laughs> and we say, oh, now we hypothesize that, right. that the, and then we can go back and of course we don't have reverse genetics, but we have great recombinant protein tools. We can study interactions. We can do a lot of things um, to, to try to understand whether or not that that hypothesis is supported or not. I think that's a big problem not having not being able to recover viruses from from clones. Absolutely, yeah, it absolutely is. It's a big problem. It's a it's a big problem. I think that yeah. um, it, it'll probably get cracked like everything else. Exactly, right? yeah, I and mean, everyone hopes they're the one. <laughs> every virus which you can't grow or you can't do this with, eventually someone if, will someone get it to work. It, right? That's right. Certainly, human noroviruses. That's been the big challenge with the norovirus yeah, field is to get it to, get, cracked, to yeah. get it to get it growing. Hep C got cracked eventually. That's right. right. Eventually, yep. Right. So. Tell the, some of our uh, listeners who are interested in uh, a career in science what what you've learned so far in your young career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wise, wise assistant <laughs> professor. Um, well, I would say that the you know it, it being a PI and being an assistant professor is a very, very, very different job than being a postdoc. Um, so you know you train at the bench and you manage your project and you know you collaborate and you write your own papers but it's it's very different than what I do on a day-to-day -day basis so um, thankfully for me what I do on a day-to-day -day basis I actually really enjoy and that's mainly writing I spend a lot of time writing about my research I spend a lot of time reading and reviewing papers and I spend a lot of time talking to people about my research and so I think that it, you know, postdocs who are really, really love the bench and really, really hate writing should do some deep thinking before they decide that that's what they, that they actually want to pursue mm -hmm. an academic career. Because that, that has seen, seemed to me as something that has really set people apart is whether or not they're thriving as the assistant professor or n being not very happy because they don't spend a lot of time at the bench. I'd say I spent, um, I did experiments for about the first six months. And then it slowly tapered from there, and now I'm you pretty... You have someone from your lab That's here, right, my graduate student. I'm pretty <laughs> exclusively in my office writing. But thankfully, um, one of my other favorite things to do is manage students and postdocs and mentor. And so what I was able to do is to recruit a very talented team of scientists and train them up enough and support them enough to say, okay, now you guys go make great discoveries at the bench and then come to me when you have an exciting result. Isn't this fun? <laughs> and then I help them write the paper and then of course I get to give the big talk and, and take all the credit for the work now. <laughs> so um, so, so it, it's, it's a really, really fun. In fact, I, I feel very blessed. I know that it's a very difficult time for people to get faculty positions and to acquire um, grant funding. And so every day that I come to work, I feel incredibly thankful for the job that I have. I feel very lucky that I ended up with mm -hmm. such a great uh, position at such a great university and have such a great lab um, you know certainly anyone who gets a lab for the first time you you know you're kind of like handed the keys and you walk into your lab and you're like whoa yeah this is really cool you know this is my this is the McDonald lab this is really really cool <laughs> um, so I'm you know I'm still maybe at that blissful stage where everything is is really 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 great and and I think also one of the things that I for me is very important is that it's a it's an incredibly flexible work schedule right. and this is important um, I think for women who have who want to have a family and have children so I have a, a four and a half year old son it's very important for me to spend time with him and so I, I can choose to leave work at 5 p.m. every day and go pick him up or if I you know want to make it to his karate class at three o'clock in the afternoon I can go and I go and then I go back to lab and it's you know sometimes I bring him into the lab and make him sort tubes and do, and do things and it's it's just it's a very flexible rewarding career and and so I'm very thankful for that it's as good, well it's good for guys too who want to see their kids that's right that's right there's a few of those out there yeah. that you know want to see their families too, I mean but. I had uh, one last year my old, our oldest son was in high school and I left early to watch him play sports right I still that's want right. to do that 
That's you right. Know. So I think yeah. for everybody, it's really flexible in that sense. And you shouldn't be totally driven that you don't take those opportunities <laughs> because they only happen once, right? That's right. So you mentioned that liking to write is an important motivator or, mm -hmm. or, or criteria for knowing whether you can do this or not. And this is something that people ask us about all the time. What signs should I have which tell me that I can do this? So writing is one according to you. But how do you know yeah. that you'll be able to manage your lab? Because that they don't teach you. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if you ever know. I mean, you definitely have to be someone who... Or, you know, you have to play well in the sandbox and work well with others. And that's not just with your lab, that's with your, your faculty and your colleagues. And, you know, you have to be a good citizen of the department. Um, uh, so I don't know if you ever really know that, but certainly you have to find ways to motivate yeah. students and postdocs. And, and also you have to be able to see the signs of, of who should you hire, who should you bring onto your team, who's going to fit well with your group and the group dynamics. and. Um, uh, you know, to keep your your yeah. your science going. I think it's a lot of common sense, basically. Yeah. And you have to keep your eyes open. And even though you really like just working at the bench as a postdoc, you have to open your eyes and look at everything that's going on and just get good, surround yourself with good people. That's exactly right. You know, especially where you go. So you're at a wonderful place. You have great colleagues. That's really right. important. Right. And if you have questions, you can ask them. That's right. Right. Uh, I don't know how to take care of this? Can you give me some advice? You can't be afraid to do that. That's right? exactly right. So, yeah. so, so can you come here to run my lab? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have too many people and too many viruses. <laughs> <laughs> well, so one day when you have 16 people, do you want to have a 16-person lab one day? I don't think I do. If you could. But I don't know if you ever, did you say, oh, I'm going to have 16 people in my lab? But, like, do you, it kind of just happens, right? Well, I mean, especially, you know, it's, a, it's a fun. I mean, you yeah. especially you find the right people. Yeah, a smart one. That's right. I have a hard time saying no to really enthusiastic people who want to work for me. And if I have the funds available to pay them, I would probably take them. I mean, you so know, the, the case to fund, as you said, it's the right people. Especially fund this. You know, for me, I I, I go fund those people that are smarter than me. Right. And, you know, they're better than me. Right. And uh, so I can learn. Right. And what's really cool now, I feel like, even though we, we're still relatively new, we have a little bit of. You know, the postdocs have been there long enough to where they can train the new students who are coming in. So there's yeah. a little bit of that um, in, in, intra-lab mentoring happening, too, which is cool. Absolutely. Because you, you can't teach cool. everyone, no. And, no. and quite frankly, a lot of them know techniques. You don't now. Know. They've yeah. developed techniques um, that I don't even know, and I'm not the person to teach them. And if they asked me where buffer X was, I'd say, oh, dear, I do not know. <laughs> right. No, no. It has, you have so, to have a chain. You have to have a chain of continuity. It's really right. important. And there have been some periods in my lab where that's been broken, and it's just very bad because it's hard to get started again. Right. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, that's great. This has been a nice episode, and um, I think we could stop because we've kept you all here an hour and a half, and that's long enough. You'll find this episode of TWIV at twiv.tv, and also... Uh, on iTunes. If you like what we do, go over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast. It's free. And also leave a comment or a star. It really helps us to stay visible on that really crowded iTunes podcast site because we want people to learn all about virology and, and listen to us talk about it. It's nothing better. Uh, we love to get your questions and comments. Normally we answer them on most TWIV. Send them to TWIV at TWIV.tv. Both of my guests today are at Virginia Tech, and I want to thank both of them for joining me. XJ Meng, thank you so much. Thank you, Mason. I really appreciate it, and thanks for inviting me here as well. I guess the students invited me, but you picked me up at the airport. That's true. Thank you very much. And Sarah McDonald, thank you. It was my pleasure. Appreciate thank it you. very much. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral.